ever seen the commercials or the viral videos, whenever they bring the little kid and he gets to meet his hero for the very first time, it may be a superhero, somebody dressed in a costume, could be like a sports star, it might be a little girl seeing her favorite pop star for the first time. They come along and maybe even know who the little child is, call him by name, and the kid just stands there, eyes this big around, slack-jawed, and they can't even speak. How are you? And the kid just sits there. Have you ever had one of those experiences? I have. Uh, in 2000, my wife and I attended a fundraising event over at Camp Barnabas, and Kurt Warner was there. And Kurt Warner, of course, you know him. He's the quarterback of the St. Louis Rams. I mean, this is just coming off their Super Bowl win. We were walking out to our car, and he's there in the parking lot. And um, I just froze. Of course, my wife, she goes over. She's chatty Kathy, you know. I'm surprised she didn't get a selfie. They didn't have cell phones back then, or, you know. But that was the first time I clammed up, I froze. I couldn't even say my name. I'm sure if he even asked, I would just... Uh, uh. But then the second time. I didn't freeze the second time. So fast forward about 14 years to 2014. I was invited to a youth pastor summit in Nashville, Tennessee. And me and a group of youth pastors was working with the Southern Baptist Convention Lifeway working through some things and talking about youth ministry and the strategies uh, of reaching teenagers. And during the weekend, Lifeway said they would take us out to dinner. And we went there in Nashville. There's a lot of great places to eat in Nashville. But they took us out in the country to a little hole in the wall. It was a house. It was like literally a house. And, and I mean, you walk in the front door in the living room, there's tables in the living room, and then the back bedroom, there's tables. And so we go in, and the, it probably, I don't know, 25, 30 people the most could eat in there. And they take us to the back room, and they had been expecting us, and they put, set us in a table. And there's probably 12 of us or so there. And we're eating. And it wasn't too long before one of the youth pastors had to go to the restroom, and he comes back, and he's going, you guys aren't going to believe this. He said, Brad Paisley's in the front room. And I'm like, yeah, right. And, and so I had to check it out. So I peeked around the corner, and there he was. So I did what any red-blooded American boy did. I pulled out my phone and walked by him and took a picture. <laughs> Here it is. That's Brad Paisley. That's his wife, Kimberly Williams. You probably remember her from the movies. She was in that Steve Martin movie, uh, Father of the Bride. Uh, they were actually having dinner with Sheryl Crow. I didn't get a picture of Sheryl Crow, though. But... I mean, I, I didn't have the guts to go up and speak to him. I was so starstruck, I just walked by and tried to be inconspicuous as I shot a photo of him. I mean, it was obvious what I was doing, but I, I, would, have, I, I would have freaked out if he would have said, Hey, Jason, why don't you sit down here? Let's eat some chicken. You've got to. We've got to tell you this story or we've been waiting for you. Of course, that's pie in the sky. That's dream. Brad Paisley would never say that. But in the Bible, we see a, 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 a picture of something just like that. Turn your Bibles, look at Luke 19. This is one of those famous children's stories. Well, they tell it to children. Children seem to like this particular story. And I think it's because our protagonist acts like a child. Look at... Luke 19, starting with verse 1, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. And so I'm going to read this a verse at a time. I'm going to break it down talk about it because there's lots of little details that you have to put together to get the whole picture of the story. Jesus, if you'll remember from last week, he had just healed Bartimaeus and now he's finally entering the town. Jericho was a major commerce area. Uh, 15 miles northeast of Jerusalem, uh, a huge agricultural area, aqueducts, plantations, huge farms and processing plants. I mean, it's just a big thing. It was, it was a wealthy region. It's almost kind of like the breadbasket of Israel, if you will. So there's lots and lots of wealthy people in this area. Okay? Let's go on. Look at verse 2. 
It says, there was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. So this is an important part of the story. This is the thing that you've got to understand before you can move on and, and understand why this, this whole story is so important. He's a tax collector. He's not just any tax collector. He's the chief tax collector of the region. Now, I don't know what that regional boundaries are, but he, he had people under him. And to be a tax collector in that culture, tax collectors are seen as traitors. These, they, they actually represent the Roman Empire. If you wanted to be a tax collector during Jesus' time, you actually bought that position. You'd go to the Roman government and you'll barter with them and you'll essentially purchase that job from the Romans. And then the Romans will tell you, we need you to collect X amount of dollars for whatever period of time. Now, what makes it so lucrative is that after you collect that amount, whatever you collect over and above, that's yours to keep. And if you have people underneath them, you can get a little cut of theirs. So, Zacchaeus, he misuses his power, and he collects more than what was owed. And so it made him wealthy, it made him influential, it made him powerful, but it also made him hated. Uh, you know, one of the scariest phone calls you'll ever receive in your life is when they say this is so-and-so with the Internal Revenue Service. That will set you back. If you've ever gotten one of those envelopes in the mail that says Department of Treasury, Internal Revenue, I mean, you'll like, I mean, like, it's a big deal. Tax collectors, I mean, if you work for the IRS, do you even tell anybody you work for the IRS? If you work for the IRS, I apologize. But Zacchaeus had grown wealthy, cheating and oppressing his fellow countrymen as kind of a, a quasi-IRS agent, if you will. But in that culture, he's the epitome of corruption. You see, in the eyes of his fellow Jews, he's so corrupt and he has sold out, he's a traitor, the worst that they can level at him, he's a sinner. He's outside of God's salvation. Nobody will have anything to do with him. Look at verse 3. It says, He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. Zacchaeus has to get a look at the teacher. Uh, this is a considerable sized crowd. And from what the scriptures say, Zacchaeus was not a very tall man. And naturally, tall people kind of obstruct your view. He can't see over the crowd, so he runs ahead of the crowd. He, it's almost like he knows that there's a bend in the road and there's a tree there. And these sycamore fig trees in Israel, their, their bottom limbs are very close to the ground. And so he begins to climb that tree so he can get just an eye on Jesus. You have to get this picture in your mind. I mean, here is a wealthy, powerful, influential man doing something completely undignified. Running. And, and they had those little robes. I'm sure he had to hike it up, don't you think? And, and he probably, his legs were probably real short, and so he's just kind of like... We represent the lollipop kill. Anyway, probably like one of those Willy Wonka people. But he was absolutely determined he wanted to see Jesus. He's just as determined as Bartimaeus. And so he does something that's completely out of character for him. He, he doesn't care if anybody makes fun of him. He's like a little kid wanting to catch a glimpse of their favorite celebrity. Look at verse 5. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, come down. Quickly, I must be a guest in your home today. So, he climbs up in the tree. Interesting thing happens. Completely unprovoked by Zacchaeus. I'm sure that Zacchaeus was just like, like me looking at Kurt Warner. And then... Just Jesus looks up and goes, hey, Zacchaeus, come on down quickly. 
I have to go to your house. Jesus invites himself to Zacchaeus' house. Now, whenever my little boy was young, we set him down and we had a very firm talk to the, him. You know, when you go to school, you're going to have friends. You do not invite yourself over to people's house. Have you ever had that conversation with your kid? The kids will do that. Mom, can I go over to so-and-so's house? You're like, putting them on the spot. And, I mean, if, if you're getting ready to be a parent, Brittany, get ready. This is going to happen. All right? It's just the way it is. Not a big deal in this culture, though. In fact, if somebody came to your house, it was a complete honor. This is a very hospitable culture. To have somebody come to your house, uh, this, is, this is a big deal. Jesus tells him, he says, come down quick. It's imperative. We have to do this right now. It's part of my, it's part of my mission. I have to be a guest in your house. And so... Zacchaeus, he climbs down quickly. But he didn't initiate any of the conversation. He didn't initiate the, the contact or the request. Jesus somehow knew his name and knew what he was about. Look at verse 6. It says, Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. I mean, of course, Zacchaeus is overjoyed. I mean, Nobody has ever wanted anything to do with him, especially a, a righteous, holy, good teacher like this, a very popular one. And so whenever he climbs down, I think he was probably just a ball of excitement, you know, running ahead of Jesus and turning around and talking to him really quickly. And just get that picture in your mind. I mean, this is something that he's really never experienced. Nobody ever wants anything to do with him, he's an outcast. Let's go on. Verse 7 says, But the people were displeased. Your translation may say they grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. So here we see, this is the crowd's reaction. Of all of the group of people, of all the crowd, I mean multitudes of people, you choose him? I mean, these, this, these people are indignant and they're shocked and they're outraged. I mean, they wanted that honor and that privilege of having Jesus, the good teacher, in their home. They wanted him to say, hey, Jason, can I come to your house? I mean, they wanted the opportunity. It had been a great honor to be able to house him and feed him overnight. But they, I'm sure that they were sitting there going, you want to go to his house? Out of all the people that you see here, you chose him. He doesn't deserve the honor of hosting you. And in some way, maybe they're afraid or maybe they believe that Jesus is somehow validating what Zacchaeus does. Kind of sweeping it under the rug, maybe. But these, these people in the crowd, they would have given anything. They would have jumped at the chance to host Jesus. But the distinction and the honor went to the city's greatest sinner. And so there at the very end it says, they grumbled. That's the same word that it uses in the Old Testament when they're talking about the Israelites wandering during the Exodus. And, and it, you know, when they don't have much to eat and there's no water and it says that they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. It's the same word. They've been doing it for thousands of years, grumbling. Let's go on. Look at verse 8. So, oh, oh, before I go on, we've got Zacchaeus climbing down. And then there's kind of a pause here. And a, the camera switches and looks at the crowd and focuses on the crowd. Camera goes back to Zacchaeus and it says, Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Don't that response sound rather abrupt to you, or maybe hurried, hasty, maybe a little bit impulsive, that he's not thinking properly. Maybe after he's given a few hours to think about it, maybe Jesus leaves, he'll go, oh, I shouldn't have said that type thing. It's, but he, he just blurts it out like the idea has just occurred to him. Something happened there between verses 6 and 8. 
when the camera switches and looks at the crowd, there's something that's taking place there that's unwritten. Because whenever a camera switches back to Zacchaeus, it says that he calls him Lord. He calls Jesus Lord. He would have never done this. Something had to have happened. He calls Jesus Lord, and then he pledges to give away half his wealth. He promises to give back four times the money that he's taxed and cheated people out of. In Judaism, it was considered generous if you would just give 20%. And here he has given two, three, four times as much as that. He offers up 50% and he promises to return four times as much. That, that completely and far exceeds what the law required if you cheated out somebody out of money. And you go back in the Old Testament and read through it. There was a prescription for if you've cheated someone out of money, how much you had to give back. And so he doesn't just go back to the law and say, okay, it says if I cheated somebody, I need to give this back. No, he went back and he said, yeah, I recognize that, but I'm terrible. i got to make this right, and I want to make it more than right. And so he pledges to give back much more than he was required to. And, and out of that, it prompts Jesus here to proclaim this. Look at verse 9. Jesus just looks at this, and I think there's a big grin on Jesus' face, and he just says, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. So here's the translation. Jesus is saying, this man will enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? It says, he calls him, look at the name he calls him there. He says he is a son of Abraham. Which, interesting, the reason he calls him a son of Abraham is because, remember, Abraham was, was a righteous man. He was righteous because it was accredited to him because of his faith. So, what we see here is that Jesus is actually saying to the crowd, Zacchaeus, a man of faith, he is righteous. He has come to trust me. He has come to, to trust what I'm going to do in just a few short weeks. He's going to trust that for his salvation. He, he, he recognizes me as God. Look at verse 10. And Jesus said, For the Son of Man, talking about Himself, the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. That's the starting point of what I want to point out this morning. Three short points. Number one, Jesus came for this purpose, to seek and save the lost. That's why He came. That was His purpose. And He makes this statement about Zacchaeus to the crowd, I mean, they've been grumbling that he had gone to be with this notorious sinner, the chief tax collector, and Jesus comes, it's almost like he emerges from the house and he says, I have to be the, the guest of this great sinner. He's why I'm here. He's the reason I'm here. I mean, Jesus didn't come to be a good teacher. He didn't come to be a moral leader. He didn't come to set a model for us how to live. Jesus says his purpose is to seek and save the lost. He had a heart for sinners. He gravitated towards sinners. According to the Jews, tax collectors are the most notorious, the most egregious of sinners. It's only natural that he would go to someone like Zacchaeus. These are the very people he came to save. And that was his practice. Even one of Jesus' disciples is a tax collector. And, and, and so as Jesus gravitates to the outcasts and the vagrants and the undesirables, his own disciple Matthew comes from that, that same occupation as a tax collector. And after Jesus calls Matthew, the, the, he gets kind of the same response from the Pharisees, from the religious leaders. The religious leaders almost question him, what are you doing? Why are you choosing him? What's, don't you understand he's a tax collector, he's a sinner? And here Jesus responds this way. Look at Mark 2.7. I got it on the board. Jesus looks at the Pharisees and he says, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. 
Zacchaeus, don't you know Zacchaeus knew he was a sinner? And as soon as Jesus stepped in his house, I think he probably just started blurting out. I mean, it's like going to confession, just started blurting out every sin he'd ever committed. Because being in the presence of Jesus changes your life. We can see by looking at the way that Jesus gravitates towards outcasts and vagrants and nobodies, undesirables. What we learn from that is nobody is beyond rescue. Everyone can be saved. Zacchaeus knew, I I can never approach Jesus because of my job. But maybe I can get a glimpse of him. Maybe I can see him. That's the, I mean, really, in truth, that's the best he could hope for, isn't it? Just to kind of get a glimpse of him. I mean, holy teachers like Jesus would never give someone like Zacchaeus the time of day. But when Jesus singles Zacchaeus out, calls him by name, and asks to be a guest in his home, the crowd, it, it interprets that Jesus is, is making a statement about how bad this guy is, but Jesus is really saying, nobody's too far gone. Even people who you think are disqualified, they're still welcome. They're still invited. Even the worst of us can be saved. And that's still true today. Nothing's changed about that. If you're here this morning and you think that your, your past disqualifies you from being one of those that can gain access to eternity, if you think your past disqualifies you, you're wrong. Maybe, you, maybe you've always been told your whole life that you don't matter, that you have no value, that you're worthless. Jesus says, that's not true. Come to me. I'll let you in. Trust in me. Or, or maybe, maybe you've got that little secret hidden sin that nobody knows about, but you know you've committed it, and you think, and you've convinced yourself that it's an unforgivable sin and that God could never forgive you for what you've done, he says, I'm still good with you. There's still hope. Nobody is beyond rescue. In fact, you're precisely the type of person Jesus would have gravitated towards. He would have wanted to dine with you. He wanted, would have wanted to share with you the good news about the sacrifice that he was going to make and how he was going to pay the penalty for your sin. Number three, authentic faith transforms. Authentic faith transforms. When someone chooses to follow Jesus, their behavior changes, their attitude changes, their priorities change, their whole worldview changes. A right response to Christ will be evident through your actions. As you confess your sins, you repent of your sins, and sometimes, maybe like Zacchaeus, you may have to offer restitution. You know, pay back people you've wronged. Zacchaeus makes this pledge that he was going to take his ill-gotten gains and he's going to give them back as evidence of his sincerity about his commitment to following Jesus. You see, he recognized his wrongs. And he knew, I have to make this right. And and so he goes even above and beyond what the law requires. That's what following Jesus does. When you commit your life to him, it changes everything. The way you think, the way you speak, even some of the people that you that you have relationships with, will change. You'll begin to desire different things because He comes in and changes your heart. So, just kind of wrap all this up. I will will say this. If if you're a Jesus follower, if if you proclaim that you follow Jesus, you would say, I'm saved. Shouldn't His heart be your heart? Shouldn't it? Absolutely. What what he loves and what he desires should be what we love and what we desire, right? And what was his heart after? The lost. Read through the book of Luke. That's a recurring theme all through the book of Luke. Jesus pursuing the lost. 
And being lost, being lost doesn't mean that you're damned or that you're doomed. Being lost simply means you're just in the wrong spot, right? You're in the wrong place. There's still hope. And that's the reason he came is to seek those that were in the wrong place out and drag them out of darkness and put them in the right spot. I mean, he said, I have come to seek and save the lost. Later in Scripture, as Paul writes, Paul calls people who follow Jesus, people who are in the kingdom, he calls us ambassadors. And so as ambassadors in the kingdom, Christ's purpose should be our purpose. And so we should see the lost and seek them out. And and we do that by becoming interested in other people's lives. We do that by taking the initiative and and actually stepping out and, and encountering some awkward, trying situations, if you will. We have to get involved in other people's lives. We have to show love. I mean, we cannot and we should not isolate ourselves from the world. Now, I I will admit, all right, it's completely healthy for believers to want to live a good moral life. And sometimes we will distance ourselves from the morally suspect practices of what we will call the world. We do that. That's understandable. But the risk is that we can become so entrenched in that type of lifestyle where we isolate ourselves and cut ourselves off from what everybody out in the world is doing, we risk becoming so thoroughly entrenched that we cease to associate with unbelievers. You know, we have this fear that if I have, if I embark on a relationship with this unbeliever, they're going to rub off on me. They're going to dirty me up. But didn't Jesus take that same risk by going to Zacchaeus' house? You think about what everybody said about him as he travels down that road headed towards the Zacchaeus' house. I mean, rumors are swirling. They had already leveled accusations against him that he is a friend of sinners and prostitutes and tax collectors. I think Jesus is going, what else are they going to say about me? They can't hurt me. The proper response for us living today in 2021, is that we would engage the lost while still exercising godly judgment. That's how you do that. And so there'll be that time as you, as you build relationships with unbelievers. There's going to be times where, where you're going to be faced with that inevitable interaction where, where their ungodly lifestyle is going to rear its ugly head. And so... The key is that we still have to maintain a Christian attitude. We still have to live according to God's standards. We still have to care for those people as a friend with sincerity. I mean, you you, want to ruin an evangelistic opportunity? Treat someone like they're a project. I mean, that's that's the quickest way to ruin the name of Christ. But model Christ's love for them. Continuously point them to Jesus as as they talk about their brokenness and and what's going on in your life. And you see all these issues that and, and it's obvious that these things are happening because they're living in sin or or they're pursuing an, an ungodly lifestyle. It's not judging them, it's just simply showing them the way, encouraging them and continuously pointing them to Jesus. I'll ask you this. Are you willing to risk a moment of discomfort or awkwardness in order to build relationships with those who need Christ? Are you willing to do that? Let me ask you this. Who led you to Christ? Didn't that person risk a moment of awkwardness? And of, of uncomfortableness? I mean... If they invited you to it, maybe you was invited to a church. That's how you became saved. Don't you think it was awkward for that person to invite you? Somebody did it for you. Can't you do it for someone else? 
Don't let the opportunity pass. You may be the only connection this person has to Jesus. You may be the only conduit for them to receive and experience Christ's love. Are you going to shut that off because you're afraid of them rubbing up against you and making you look bad, giving you a bad name, soiling your reputation? I think Jesus would say, go for it. So this Easter, I mean, it's just two weeks away. Challenge for you. One person. Bring one person. Take the card. Take those little invite cards. That's the reason we had them made. For you to take them. Keep them in your purse. Keep them in your pocket. If you, if you run out, there's more available in the lobby. But give, take it and give it to someone else. Invite them to church. You never know what's going to happen on Easter. They could come. The gospel's going to be presented. They could respond. It could change their life. Are you willing to risk it? I sure hope so. Let's pray. Bradley, you want to come on up? This is a... I just want you to begin to think about who you're going to give your card to. I want you to think about how that conversation is going to go. I want you to think about what you're going to say. Begin to pray over your card that it would make a difference. Let's, let's go to the Lord. Father, I'm, a, I'm thankful that you put people along my path that pointed me to you. Lord, I'm thankful for those that modeled Christ-like love and were sincere in their relationship with me. Lord, that they loved me so much that they refused to see me travel down a path that I was headed. And Father, I know that you would desire that of us too. We, we are your brothers, we're your sisters. Our heart should be your heart. And you loved the lost. You that's the reason you came, to seek and save the lost. And so, Father, just over the next two weeks, I pray you would open our eyes to see people around us who need you. Give us opportunities to hand those cards out. Give us opportunities. And, and Lord, I, the awkwardness, I just pray that you'd tear all that down. I pray that you'd give us a boldness and a courage to be able to walk up to maybe even somebody we've never met in our life. Give the card away and invite them to the Easter service. Lord, because we've experienced the transformation that it makes in our life and we know what a difference it makes. And we look forward to having other brothers and sisters make that decision this Easter. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.